Hi, hello everyone. I'm Noelle. I uh, work at the River Center Branch Library, and um, we are so excited to have Desiree Proctor and Erica Harrell here. Um, Desiree and Erica are the co-authors of an upcoming graphic novel called Nuclear Power uh, that's coming out. Is it this month, y'all? The end of it's August? The digital issues are out now on yeah. Comixology. Okay. And then so, the trade paperback comes out in October. There you go. Okay, so pre-order your paperback, but then go download it from Comixology. And uh, they are here to give us the Blue Collar Girl's Guide to a Hollywood Writing Career. Awesome. I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to apologize for not being there in person. We yeah. really wanted to come and maybe next year. Yeah, hopefully. Whoops. Awesome. Um, so Erica and I are both from very small towns in Florida. Um, and we always wanted a career in entertainment industry and it just seemed so unreachable to us from because of where we were from and not knowing anybody in the industry but we figured it out and now we're hoping that we can share what we learned with y'all and um anybody else that like is interested in doing the same thing um, likes torturing themselves maybe <laughs> Um, as was mentioned, we uh, have a comic book that is right now uh, coming out on Comixology, but Desiree and I have worked across a wide variety of mediums. Um, we've done television, uh, we've done video games for Telltale Games, as well as Skybound and other mobile game companies. And um, we have also uh, worked for DC Comics and did the DC Talent Development Workshop. Um, which is a great program. Yeah, but of course we didn't start off as writers. Um, we started our careers in Hollywood as production assistants. Um, I worked on American Gladiators, Key and Peele. Um, we worked on Entourage and we also like made our own shorts and stuff. And that's how we got our start. Um, but I'm sure like, as I wanted to know when I was first starting out, how do you even get a job as a production assistant? What are entry level jobs that you can get in the entertainment industry, um, that will like set you up for a career as a television writer. So that's what we'll go over next. Um, like I mentioned, we started off as a production assistant. And like, how do you get a job as production assistant? Well, I use staffmeup.com when I was first starting out. Um, and there's also a ton of Facebook groups now. Facebook a lot of, yeah, Facebook groups. Like I need a production assistant. There are several like email groups. If you happen to know somebody who is also a PA who can help you get onto an email group. Um, the local, your local film commission. Uh, when I was working in, I'm from this town called Oviedo, Florida. And the biggest, next biggest town is Orlando, Florida. And so I signed up, I reached out to the local Orlando Film Commission and I signed up to get on their contact list. Um, so when productions were coming into the city and they needed a production assistant, they could just look people up by name and like reach out to me. And I got some commercial work when I was still in Florida through the local film commission. Yes. And then of course, also the literary agency mailroom. And this is more like if you've already moved to Los Angeles and you were looking to have an entry-level job working as maybe a, um, a mailroom assistant or perhaps sometimes a floating uh, assistant who would like cover an agent or a manager's desk. And the top four agencies um, still currently in Los Angeles are William Morris Entertainment, CAA, UTA, and ICM. And then there's a bunch of other more boutique agencies and management companies and those, you know, handle clients in different ways, like Verve, Kaplan, Staller, Paradigm. Desiree and I are now, once uh, we've gotten this far, we're repped by the Kaplan Staller agency as well as a manager. Yeah, and, uh, and the great thing about a mailroom is, um, you know, you start off the mailroom and it seems like a very simple job, just like bringing agents their mail every day, but eventually you move your way up to, as Erica mentioned, a floater or an agent assistant. 
And once you're actually on a desk as an Asian assistant, you're working directly with writers and directors and producers and talent and you're getting to see like how business is done, how deals are made. And it's very like, it's very educational, like on the job education. And if you make a good relationship there, that can often lead to a job as like an assistant to a high profile writer, which can lead to eventually a job as a writer on a show. Yes, like Desiree mentioned, it's like the mailroom is kind of the like business almost side of things, whereas like a production assistant, you'll see how every department functions on like a show or a movie. So you'll see like how costumes works with props and how set dressing and art department like all function as well as camera and grip and lighting. And you kind of get more of an idea of how things actually get made as opposed to maybe some of the stuff that's like development or legal or business affairs deals that are being made or writers rooms that may be staffing up. Yeah. And then the thing about working as a production assistant, which is a bit of a unusual route for a career as a writer. I mean, it's definitely the route that we took, but it came, it comes in a lot, very handy because you are one-on-one with all the different departments on set. Um, You know, you get an idea of how much things cost and a big part of writing, especially in television is knowing your budget and writing to your budget. Um, so like working, actually being on set and in an office, you get an idea of all of that stuff. Um, another like popular entry level job is studio network page program. So this is an also, if you're in Los Angeles, um, every studio has one CBS, NBC, Paramount, and you, you work on these studio lots. Um, a lot of it is just when you're first starting out, like, you're working like the late, late show and you're bringing in the audience, et cetera. But it gives you a chance to meet like executives. And um, one of our good friends started off at the NBC page program. And then she got a job as an assistant, one of the, one of the executives and she worked her way up. And now she's director of current programming at NBC. So she oversees all of their television shows now. And she started off as a page. Yes, we had another friend who did the page program who was, you know, aspiring to be a writer. And then she interviewed with um, our showrunner at the time for writer's assistant position. And they really connected over the fact that both of them had actually been pages. So they had like kind of a lot of, you know, common interests in that. So it was a very good way for networking, which is what we will segue into next. Networking. (laughs) So uh, there's a reason Hollywood is all about who you know, because relationships are key. Um, And how do you like form relationships with people that are in the industry? I mean, for us, it was, it it wasn't easy because we, when we moved out of Los Angeles, we didn't know really anybody. Um, So we found these groups like script writers network, writer assistant networks. Uh, We went to screenings and now Twitter is also very popular, which is handy now because a lot of people are not meeting in person. Um, Absolutely. And like, you know, when we would go do these networking meetups, it's like you wanted to make sure that you're keeping track of who you met and like perhaps where they work. And a lot of the, you know, people that we met, you know, maybe like five, six, seven years ago are people who have also risen through the ranks like we have in different ways. Like we have friends who are now also writers on different television shows or movies. And we also have friends who were maybe working as um, like development assistants who are now, like Desiree mentioned, like working as like the head of current programming or the head of development at different studios and networks. And those are contacts that we're continuing to maintain. Yeah, another great route is film festivals or conventions like this. Um, We've, we like our very first pitch um, happened from going to like a convention and we went up to one of the booths and started talking to an executive who happened to work at Disney Animation. And we were just like, we have an idea. We'd love to come pitch it to you. And we were just, you know, nobody's very great. Yeah, without representation or anything. And it was, it was like, you know, she was very kind and she was like, well, I can't take your pitch here and that's not something I can do. However, you know, handed the business card and was kind of like make a contact outside of the convention. And then we were able to pitch to that person. And that yeah. pitch led to us getting other pitches and then eventually selling that idea. 
yeah, so film festivals, comic conventions, like volunteering is a great way. Just if you can't attend, if it's too expensive to attend, volunteering is a great way to be to participate in that. And also winning the festival. Winning the festival is just like a great way to get representation. We'll talk about what representation is a little bit later, um, but it's a good way to get noticed. And of course, your favorite phrase in Hollywood is let's get drinks, let's get coffee. Now it's let's get a Zoom meeting. Yeah. <laughs> no. Let's Zoom coffee. Yeah. Um, but it's a way to, when you meet people at these different events, get their contact info and then take them out for coffee or a drink or just like set up a Zoom chat if you can, because um, you want to maintain those relationships. And you want to just keep following up. I mean, what Erica and I do is we have like a contact list and we like put every single person we meet, how we met them, when we met them. Where they work, like what projects did we submit to them or if they wanted to read us, like, and how to do that. Yeah. And then we keep updating it every time we reach out to them. And if it's, if we feel like we haven't reached out to people in a while, we'll check the contact list, see who we talked to last, and who we need to follow up with. Um, as Erica mentioned before, like the people that you start off with is the people that you're gonna like grow with. So if you're reaching out to people and maybe people you don't know very well, it's usually better to go to someone's assistant than to like an executive or a showrunner um, because someday those people will become an executive, they'll become a showrunner. Um, and of course, like, the most important thing is to be genuine and be consistent. The contact list helps with consistency, but also if you don't genuinely like these people, don't stay in contact with them. Yeah, because there's a lot of, you know, tendency for Los Angeles to be a fake place and people being fake. And we've never been like, oh yeah, we really want to stay in contact with those people that are just kind of using you or being, you know, like, awful to deal with and so it's like we really try with our you know networking and with even people that we end up mentoring this is one of the big things is like be very consistent but just like don't pester people but be genuine with them mm -hmm. and like we said repeatedly like we can't emphasize how important this is the people you meet with when you first start out are they going to be the ones who help you the most like when erica and i were both working as assistance to writers um, and trying to become writers ourselves, we befriended an assistant that was working at CBS as an executive assistant. And she wanted to someday be a development executive. And we were trying to become writers and she needed to get experience giving people notes and we needed to get to become better writers. So we would just send her draft after draft of things that we were writing and she would give us notes on that. And you know, she became a better executive through that. And now she's like head of development at a big production company. And we're now working writers and we continue to work together and develop shows with her. Um, so like I said, like the people that you're sitting next to right now are the people that you want to maintain those relationships and continue working with. Yes. And as Desiree mentioned earlier, we'll talk a little bit about getting literary representation. Um, for us, like we mentioned, it's like we didn't have that when we moved out to Los Angeles. We didn't really know a lot of people and didn't really know how it works, but- We didn't even know what it was. Yeah, yeah we, didn't, we didn't know what the difference between like an agent or a manager was. Um, yeah, so. so yeah, an agent's purpose, a literary agent's purpose is to find you work. The agents tend to sign very established writers and they also tend to have big lawyers and legal representation at the agencies that will then help the minutia of all of your contracts like um, that you get and making sure that like legally you're being sort of represented there on their end. Whereas a manager, a literary manager helps writers kind of develop their voice. They're more likely to sign like unproven talent or someone who's maybe just made a short film or like just has a couple script samples and they will read iteration after iteration after iteration of something that you write. That's kind of their job. They're more like day-to-day. -day. Sometimes they can be like the shoulder that you cry on and sometimes they can be like also out there looking for work for you as well. Yeah, they're, the reason that managers do this is 
managers, unlike agents, um, they can become producers on your work. So let's say they're developing an idea with you and you both and you end up selling that idea and it goes to series, the manager will get an executive producer credit, whereas like agents aren't allowed to do that. So agents are more like short term getting you that gig that pays week after week managers are there for like the long haul. Um, so a great way to get literary, like to get an agent, if you have a manager, is a manager, once they feel confident in you, um, can connect you with agents. Um, another great way to get representation is like we mentioned before, winning a writing competition or directing fellowship. Um, uh, some of the great like competitions are like the nickel screen writing competition, screen craft, Austin Film Festival has a writing competition and we've known people that have gotten reps from winning those competitions um, and the Humanitas program. And then there's different fellowships. Writing and directing fellowship programs, depending on what your interest could be. And these open up usually every year around the springtime. Um, there's NBC's Writers on the Verge, Warner Brothers uh, Television Writers Workshop, um, which I believe is now like morphing into like what was the HBO one. There's the Disney ABC writing program. Some of these are paid um, and some of them are not. And you usually have to um, submit samples of your work. You usually have to write an essay, you know, kind of put together your resume. Some of them require like letters of recommendation. It's multi-step process, but they usually open up between like, you know, February and April of every year. And you, you know, go through like a, a long process of like submitting for them, but they really can help writers break in directly to a writer's room. Some of them are training programs that will like be, you know, 12 weeks long or so, and then they will like help you get on staff. Yeah. And um, what's, What's great about these programs is, like Erica mentioned, they're trying to put you directly on staff of one of their shows, and they specifically focus on television writing. Um, and they look at not only like your packet that you send in, but they look at how many times you apply. So, you know, if you end up applying this year, or next year, and you don't get in, don't feel discouraged, just keep applying because. A lot of the people that we know that got into these programs that are now working as writers, they didn't get in the first time. Um, yeah. But like and, the, the people that run the program look at how committed you are. Yes, they definitely note how many times you've been there. And also just to clarify what we mean by on staff is that most television shows that are produced have a writer's room. That's comedy and drama. And it is like a room full of people who are all there um, led by a showrunner and the showrunner um, kind of helps guide breaking the story for an entire season of TV. And so when you get on staff, there's different levels. Everyone, it's kind of an entry level position is called a staff writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what these programs, these fellowships by NBC and Warner Brothers, et cetera, they're specifically looking to get you that first staff writing job. Um, and then another way to get literary representation, which Erica touched on earlier, is through your network, um, through your, your friends, executives you might know, coworkers. Uh, we got our first agent um, through a friend who is a writer's assistant. And that friend um, who Erica worked with at the time had a friend who had just been promoted to agent and was looking for new clients and was kind of willing to take more of a risk to sign mm -hmm. people like us who weren't who had maybe sold something but didn't have tons of experience yet and even our current manager was um recommended to us by one of our college friends actually and we went to college with him in florida and he has kind of moved up through the industry and um you know, he's a big horror producer and executive producer on a ton of horror movies now. And so we were like, hey, like we're looking for new reps. Like, who do you know? Who do you like? Who do you like, again, being like genuine care about in this industry? And he recommended our current uh, manager who's actually from uh, New Orleans. And um, he had been an agent for many years. So now he had transitioned to manager and that's how we have him. Yeah. 
Um, so we're talking about getting representation and winning competitions, but of course you have to learn how to write first. And when I first moved to Los Angeles, you know, I went to this very small film school in Florida. And when I got out to LA, I was like, oh, this film school did not prepare me for Los Angeles whatsoever. <laughs> and so um, I decided to start taking writing courses. And I was working, you know, 10, 12 hour days on shows. And so a lot of the courses I was taking were online courses. So a lot of these places like Writing Pad, UCLA Writing Extension, even Upright Citizen Brigade, which specific, like focuses on comedy writing, um, they have online courses. So you don't even need to be in Los Angeles to take these courses. But the great thing about these places like Writing Pad and UCLA Extension is they are taught by people that work in the industry. Um, so not like getting theoreticals, like, and that was a lot in our film schools, like it could be like this when you get out there and we weren't necessarily, like Desiree said, prepared. And you also sometimes think you're like, eh, is it really worth it for me to take a class? And for us, we did a sketch writing comedy class at the Upright Citizens Brigade, which was actually like on the weekends um, in person. And we ended up, you know, writing a bunch of sketches. We came out of it with like a comedy sketch packet sample in addition to our other television samples. But that, um, that packet of just funny sketches ended up getting us work for like many years just based on kind of taking a class. It's like paid for itself multiple times over. Yeah. Yeah, I think the key is like investing in yourself is really important. Um, and on that note, let's talk about money. Um, so if you are thinking about moving to Los Angeles, how much should you have saved before you make this big move? Me personally, I had like three months worth of savings. I moved out here in 2008. There was the recession and the WGA writer strike. So there wasn't a lot of work. Uh, I was just picking up gigs here and there. And so I was able to, like, I ran through that three months worth of savings in about six months. And at the time I was like, oh, I wish I'd saved up six months worth of savings before moving out here. Um, and I feel like that it's kind of similar now in terms of a little bit harder to find work. Yeah, absolutely. And I came out, you know, with savings as well. I was also working in retail. Um, in Florida when I was there and working through high school and through college at the same company. And I was able to transfer with my retail job to like a mall in Los Angeles. And I worked in retail full time while I was trying to either intern or be like a development assistant or get on a desk and then eventually like be a PA. But I, I kept that retail job like for as long as I could until I actually felt comfortable enough to stop working in retail and full-time work in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, and which is a very smart move to make. I know a few people that have done that. They've transferred out with their jobs, even if it's just like, you know, if you're working as a Starbucks barista, just transferring to a different Starbucks and just like, so you have some sort of income coming in in addition to your savings um, rather than doing it the very dumb way that I did it. <laughs> um. And then another thing is like, should you be spending money to make your own short films, comics, et cetera, when you're like trying to pay bills, you're working long hours. And I mean, I think it goes back to the idea of investing in yourself. Um, I think the best thing Erica and I ever did for our career was to continue producing our own work. My second year in Los Angeles, I put on a play at the Los Angeles Fringe Festival because I could afford it, you know, I could rent out a small black box theater. It was within my budget. It was cheaper than doing a short film or doing a comic or something, but it let people know, like when I first moved to LA, that writing was something I wanted to pursue and was serious about. And it let people see my voice. Yes, and even absolutely like later than that, like I've worked on features that I've helped produce and make and fund short films and um, our comic nuclear power, like, we partnered with um, an independent publisher, but we had to hire the artist ourselves, which means like we had to decide like, is it worth it? And, you know, that's an investment that we decided to make a couple of years ago and we were able to like, you know, 
pay an artist and have now a product when the trade paperback comes out in October, that will be like another sample of our writing and something that we can like hand to executives, you know, on the film and on the TV side as well. Yeah. Um, and then film school, it's expensive. Is it worth going to film school if you want a career in the industry? The answer to that is maybe. Uh, Erica and I were both very like lucky in that at the state of Florida, um, if you graduate from a Florida high school with a certain GPA, they will pay for you to go to a Florida university. So we were able to graduate from film school without debt. And a lot of the people that we met in film school uh, also moved to LA and work in the industry. And like we said, we've gotten work from them. We've gotten them work. Um, we met each other because of that. And so in that sense, it's like back to that, it's all about who you know, the networking side of it. Yeah, it can be valuable. I mean, like there are, of course, writer's rooms that are like staffed up by entirely rooms of Harvard Lampoon people. Um, or it's like, oh, you went to NYU and they all stay in a little click together. And so definitely it can be worth it on that end, but in terms of practicality, like maybe not. You can also yeah. get out there and make your own contacts, do your own thing. Take your own, take own individual courses that are specifically in what you want. That'll be cheaper than spending like tens of thousand dollars and potentially going into debt. Um, and now we've talked about like kind of how you get into the industry, but going back to the writing ideas, like we well, need to have the script that impresses people enough that they want to hire you, they want to sign you, et cetera. So how do you do that? Um, so we're going to give some tips of like what, just some broad tips of what we use when we're developing an idea into a script. And everyone says this one, like, write what's personal to you, like, write what you know. And it's like, I feel like that that was a little eye rolly when people would tell me that at the time. And I would just be like, oh, come on. But ultimately, one of the first, you know, sam writing samples um, that Desiree and I put together was a comedy. And we just had like a what if question that we were asking. And it was like, what if my crazy dad married her crazy mom, even though the two had never met each other? And, you know, we had actually even not met each other's like parents at that time, but it was a what if question that we kept like building on that because we both had these wild childhoods growing up. And so both of those things were very personal to us. And it became a sample that, again, has gotten us so much work over and over again, because it was something that was like so intimately personal to us. Yeah. And the comic book that nuclear power is also very personal to us. I mean, it's an, it's an alt history on the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis really affected like both of our lives, um, even though it happened before we were born because both of our moms are Cuban and they, you know, my mom was living in the States when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened and in Florida and you know, like Cubans were being attacked there. And it's like her family kind of just had to like go into hiding. Um, Erica's mom escaped Cuba shortly after the missile crisis. And, and so she was trying to assimilate in this country where there was a lot of just hostility um, and things like that. And, you know, there was a sense of urgency on her part to become as American as possible, to like lose her accent to, you know, a lot of, you know, Cuban uh, families actually like ended up not teaching their kids Spanish. Like, I don't know Spanish that well. I can understand it, but it was just a product of her being like, everything was taken from me in that place. And so I'm not that anymore. And um, it was, you know, long lasting effects in both of our families, it turned out. So, and we're also just really interested in history. And like, again, it was asking those kind of what if questions. It's almost like a bit of a like improv game that you kind of keep iterating on. Like, what if the bombs had gone off? What if like the world were different? What if we had a different, government and that's kind of what we built into and then after you know you land on what you want to write about the first thing that we do is we start with a log line so a log line is a one to three sentence description of your story that's you know you want to hook the reader's imagination and the reason that we start with a log line a lot of people do the log line at the end everybody has their own system their own way of doing things but the reason we start with a log line is it helps us hone in on what is unique about our story. 
Um, so we'll use like nuclear power as an example. So our log line for nuclear power is a nuclear power, a young mother leads a new American revolution 60 years after World War III reshaped the United States in order to protect her unborn nuclearly enhanced child. So it's just one sentence, but it unpacks a lot. It starts with the title, and then we get right into who our protagonist is, a young mother, and then what she's doing. She's leading a new American revolution. So you're, you're letting the audience know this is going to be a military story. And then you say 60 years after World War III reshaped the United States. And you're like, okay, that cues you into it's alt history. And then it's like, goes back into what she's doing in order to protect her unborn nuclearly enhanced child, science fiction. So yes, this one- As well as stakes. It's like, this is her personal stakes. It's yeah. all within that sentence. Yeah. It tells you exactly like what the tone is, who your lead character is, what the stakes are and kind of what the world is. Yeah, because um, people are always like, what's your elevator pitch? Or like, what's your thing? And it's like, if you can tell people your log line, that's kind of what they're getting at. Uh, when they ask for that kind of like quick introduction to you know what your idea is who am I following why do I care and where does it take place mm -hmm. the next thing we do is character sheets for each of our main characters um, and character sheets like help you hone in on what's unique about your character including their character flaws and a good character flaw can help add stakes to your story I mean I feel like Everybody's seen Star Wars. Star Wars, um, the first one, A New Hope, is a great example of this. Han Solo's big character flaw was his gambling debts. And at a pivotal moment in the story where the Empire is approaching Yavin, there's going to be a big battle. He leaves when these people need him the most because his concern is paying off this gambling debt. Um, and of course, at the end, as we all know, he comes back in and helps like Luke save the day, but it really like raised the stakes of that moment. Um, another thing we like to include on our character sheets is like the ambition, the character's ambition versus the character's ultimate story goal. And these two things should be in conflict because it adds dramatic tension. For example, in our comic book, um, our main character's ambition is to have a family, but her the goal in the story is to overthrow the government, <laughs> which of course makes her a target. Things. Yeah, <laughs> puts her at risk quite a lot. So, um, will she achieve her ambition? Uh, I'll have to read and find out. <laughs> And then what we also do before, this is all before we even start writing our script, we write out the world, rules of the world. So if you're writing about a specific real world culture, you want to do research. For example, Erica and I are writing on this new show for Disney Channel right now, and it's about a Mexican American family um, who, and it involves a lot of like Lucha Libre. And so we, I mean, we are, we're from Florida, so we already watched a ton of WWE. We already knew about res, American wrestling. So that was very helpful, but we went and we watched documentaries on Lucha Libre. Like and history books on Mexico and Mexican culture and the like Aztec, you know, and Mayan, you know, empires. Like what can we, you know, bring to our writer's room that may be like, inspirational or even funny like can we tell like a funny story about what happened to our families even if they're not mexican-american that like then we can adapt and like make culturally relevant to the show mm -hmm. um but your world might have like supernatural beings and what are the powers of these supernatural beings like our comic nuclear power has supernatural beings in it and we very had very specific powers um, in mind and because it's called nuclear power it was like should their powers be enhanced by like what would really happen potentially if like a nuclear bomb went off so we would want it to like ground their powers and not just make them you know like they could fly or something like yeah that, that like sense. didn't really make sense um and like what specifically are their limitations so then we know like whatever scene we're in it's like the character can do these things but they definitely cannot do these because you just don't want to spiral out of control with like wild things that are happening yeah 
Um, and if you're creating your own world, like Star Wars is a good example, what are the rules for existing and moving around in that world? Um, so these are just good things to know before you even like start writing the script and scripts script writing is all about iteration so after you write your first script you might find yourself going back and reworking a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. and like finding the people who will be able to honestly tell you what's not working about your script is much more valuable than sending someone a bunch of your writing and then being like it's great it's like no you don't want to hear it's great because like you know it's not always great <laughs> like you need people to tell you no <laughs> like you need people to be like uh, this isn't working for me but getting those brutally honest conversations can be tough. Yeah. And you can, so you can use these rules of the world to build stakes. I think uh, the movie Coco from Pixar is a good example of this. Um, when Miguel goes to like the um, after world, like the rules of that world is if he's there for too long, he can't, return back to the living world. Um, so that adds like this timer to the movie and to his story is like, he's got to get in there, accomplish what he's trying to accomplish and get out before it's too late for him. Yes. And we'll just go into some last thoughts. Yeah, you know, we definitely have to, like we mentioned, like for the show that we're currently on, like kind of immerse ourselves in like the documentaries about Lucha, we're reading history books, like, but we also try to read a lot of scripts and rewatch a lot of TV shows and movies. And we would advise this to anyone, like what's the show that you love or really what's a show that you hate and what was not working about that as well. It'll help you like learn structure and how to make character voices. And that's very helpful as a TV writer. Um, like the show we're on right now, like we did not create the show and we're coming in to basically mimic like how our showrunners are writing the show. And so that requires like flexibility and to be adaptable and you know, just a lot of things that are um, really helpful because you know in television, it's not like everyone's a unique snowflake. You can certainly bring your own experience to it, but it's like, you're also ultimately writing characters that are existing. Um, another important thing is this industry is a marathon. It's not, it's it's not like a short race it's not a sprint to the finish line um i think you know for us for erica and myself there is a point where you know we had been out here for eight years or something and we're like we're still we'd picked up gigs here and there writing gigs and sold a couple of projects but our main income was still working as like assistants and we just felt like Failure. Is this going to work out for us? Yeah. And in hindsight, we were like actually much further ahead than we realized. Um, and eventually we did get like staffed and we've been working as we've been working full time as writers now for a few years. And, you know, I wish I had gone back, but it could go back in time and tell my younger self that. Um, I think a great, I got a great piece of advice when I was an assistant, I was driving Keegan Michael Key to set. And he asked me like, you know, what do you wanna do um, with your like career? And I told him I wanted to write. And he's like, he's like, give it seven years. And he said, and I don't mean seven years in terms of you're gonna make it and be writing full time, working full time as a writer seven years to just have your first, get your first gig. Um, and he talked about how like, he used to be a, a theater professor and then he like got a gig working at doing like a uh, sketch comedy in Chicago. And he was just doing sketch comedy for years and years and years before he got on um, Mad TV. But like, once he got that live performance sketch comedy gig, he knew like that he was on the right path. Um, so I found that to be like very, very helpful advice. Uh, it really put things in perspective for me at the time. Absolutely. Um, and checking your ego at the door. And this one is kind of like goes to those like sort of entry-level jobs all the way to like us being writers. Like 
no one of course wants to move to LA and get coffee for people or lunch for people. They don't want to do it. But if people see you do a good job at those kind of menial tasks, most of the time you consistently work and most of the time you will be thought of in promotion. And that definitely helps. And on the writing side of it, like I kind of touched on earlier, it's sort of like you have to find people who will be brutally honest with your work and you can't get so defensive about your writing. Like all day long, we're in writer's rooms and it's like, you'll pitch a joke and like two people will laugh and you're like, oh man. Or sometimes you pitch a joke and it's like everyone in the room laughs and it gets in the script and you feel really great about that, but you can't throw a fit every time someone doesn't like the first joke that you throw out or you know if an executive gives you notes back it's usually like okay well like let me even if I completely disagree with this and it makes me so angry like let me go and see like what's the note behind the note and how can I objectively look at my writing and say you know what I kind of need to like go back in to have a rethink do this you know a little bit better on the next pass yeah and really also that point is like no gig is too small um you know i think when we were starting out we took whatever writing gig we could if it was just writing a blog um or doing like a joke pass on somebody's script um and you know we've had friends who like oh they're like oh well doing something like that i'm like i'm too good for that or something and so it ends up being like well, you just don't work um and you can learn something on every job so yeah even like when we kind of took a, a sidestep and and wrote video games even though we were more passionate about comics and tv and movies we we're like is this a sidestep is this going down the wrong path ultimately like it was a really hard industry to be in but we were able to like learn a lot from that industry and learn how to like adapt and change like it was definitely a learning experience mm -hmm. yeah but a lot of people would not have made that move they would have thought well i do tv i would never write video games and it taught us this whole different type of storytelling of player driven storytelling interactive storytelling and it's been very beneficial and a lot of we ended up on a back on a television show that was interactive um, so a lot of these worlds are like melding together and that's not something we could have ever predicted, but because and almost like no one had any interactive experience in that writer's room. In fact, we came in as like the experts of that because we had taken, you know, a, a side road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you never know what job will lead you where, um, pay it forward. You know, it's like people, as we mentioned, we've talked about several people that have helped us get work. I think it's important to to help other people. It's instead of rather than paying people back, I think it's better to pay other people forward. Um, it was the first piece of advice I was getting given when I moved to LA. Like the first guy that got me a job was like, "Oh my gosh, how can I pay you back?" He's like, "Don't worry about paying me back. Just pay it forward. Get other people work." And I really took that to heart. We both like mentor with our college as we mentioned our, our film school isn't doesn't really prepare you for la and so going being able to go back and mentor students and prepare them for things that we weren't prepared for absolutely um, and even people now because we are like quote on staff and we are now executive story editors in our in our writer's room like we you know we'll sometimes go out of our way to make sure that we ask the writer's assistants who like were us like a few years ago and the script coordinators and those support staff like hey do you have a sample like we'll happily read it for you like we will give you notes on it if you want or if there's a fellowship or something that they're up for it's like you want a letter of recommendation like happy to do that too you know and that kind of like makes them also feel comfortable and most of the time they're like whoa most people don't acknowledge us like that and it's like well that's what we would have wanted when we were in those positions yeah um so as you can tell from like everything we've talked about like a career as an artist is a struggle it's a lot of work um and so and time consuming like we've not had a weekend off i think this almost the entirety of this year because we're so fortunate to have work and you know, working in television, but we're also writing two features and we're writing a new comic for Marvel and we have nuclear power coming out. 
And that means that we most of the time wake up at like six in the morning and we're on the phone with each other by like eight in the morning. And then we work sometimes after work and we work on Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> and and it's, it's a lot. Yeah. And we've been doing that for years because when we were working as assistants, you know, you needed to make the time to write. And so we'd work, you know, 12 hour days during the week on set. And then on the weekends we'd meet up and we'd write. And I remember I got my first gig when I was an assistant on uh, a production assistant on Entourage. And uh, so I'd have to be at work at seven in the morning. So I'd wake up at three in the morning, write for this gig and then like go to work. Um, so it's, it is, if you, if you really want it, you really have to work for it. Um, so make sure you want it before trying to do it. Otherwise it's obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is how to find us. Um, as we mentioned, we have our comic that's out on Comixology and Hoopla right now, and will be coming out as a trade paperback in October. It's published by Fanbase Press. They're an incredible indie, um, comic publisher with really like supportive owners and amazing an amazing staff. So you can find our comic there. I'm also on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I don't do Twitter. <laughs> and that's yeah, if there's any questions, let us know. Yeah, thank you both so much. Uh, we've got time for a couple of questions. If anybody's got one, just come on up to the mic right here. Hey, so my question is this, when you make pitches, how do you ensure that they don't take your pitch idea and just elaborate and make it their own when you go to these meetings? That's a great question. That's a great question. Like, thank you so much for that. Um, most of the time, I mean, like you, it's trust-based. And now that you also have the representation of agents and managers, um, they are actually kind of like, they pre-give the idea um, to whatever executive you may be pitching to. So they've kind of like given them a soft pitch to say like, hey, are you looking in the area for something like nuclear power? It's about female protagonists. It's like an alt history take. So they, they've kind of like already given them a little bit of information about the pitch, like most of the time before you go in and pitch. And there is therefore a legal trail like with that happening. Um, and we're very fortunate that it hasn't really like happened to us or somebody's like stolen our idea. But before we had representation, what we would do is we would register all our scripts and all our pitches with the Writers Guild. And you can do it online. You don't need to be a member of the Writers Guild. Um, so, so we'd pitch it and have the certificate. We obviously wouldn't bring the certificate into the pitch, but you know we'd at least have a record that the idea was pre-existing. And if you want further protection, what you can do is you can submit your idea and get it copyrighted by the federal government before you pitch it. Yeah, and then also like there can be paper trails via emails and things like that as well. Like if you're like really unrepresented, you can say like, "Look, no, I attached this pitch or the script or whatever," and you'll have that time and date stamp too. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. No problem. Hey, Erica and Desiree, Steve Andes. Hey, hey. Steve, how are you? Right. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I know, we always get to meet virtually, right? I know. Um, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for, this is such great, stuff um one thing that uh you know just out of curiosity like what what would you say a benefit to working as a team has been and also maybe if has there been any kind of obstacles or or downsides to that not that you have to <laughs> uh go into anything that was uh, sticky between you i don't know but like uh but we'll air uh, all the drama yeah right yeah yeah <laughs> Um, that's a, another really great question. Like, I would say that, you know, there's a lot of benefits like from us personally, but there's also benefits uh, on the studio and network side um, to writing teams working together, especially in television. Um, in, in TV, uh, 
the writing team is basically two for one. So we split a salary, which means that showrunners and the networks and studios, they get two bodies, two brains in the room for the price of one. So it's like a huge incentive. It was a way that kind of like would help us get on staff, um, especially like a few years ago when like it wasn't as common to be staffing women in writer's rooms. Um, and, you know, on a personal level, it's like we have somebody who's just going to be very brutally honest, like we were mentioning in our presentation, you know, with each other, like what's working about the script or what's not working, what joke could be improved upon. Um, and we'll just very much like say no to you, which then also does help in a writer's room as well, because you're already kind of used to like feedback like that. Yeah. And um, it, it helps us take on multiple projects when there's two of us um, to split the work. But uh, as Erica mentioned, splitting the paycheck is definitely a downside. Um, so that doesn't that certainly doesn't make things easier. Um, and having a writing partner, generally speaking, it's like it's like being in a relationship. So, you know, we have like a shared calendar and we block off time to write and we have to discuss like each other's schedules. Um, so we can't just necessarily like, unless we're going off and doing, working on our individual collective pieces. projects. Yeah. Um, and, you know, before, and like I mentioned, it is like dating. Like I had, uh, I would try writing with a couple other people before Erica and just didn't click and, you know, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, it's like, who can be reliable, like, and that's a big one of just like, are they actually going to show up and block out those three hours? Like, eh. like, um, are they hardworking? Like, you know, do you each bring different things to the table? Like Desiree is really, really strong with structure. Like she's really good at like character development. Like she's great at like doing like crazy things. Like I've even come to her and been like, I had a dream last night about weird thing insert weird thing here and she's like oh I know how we can make that work by doing this 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 and this and we can get there whereas like then I will make a fart joke and then people will laugh in our room <laughs> <laughs> yes, Erica's very good with like uh dialogue and uh all these like like quick remarks that I'm not necessarily like the greatest at <laughs> well thanks last last question would be um what I know you just spent the last, you know, 50 minutes talking about these important things about writing. Um, but what would be like top, you know, one or two rules for young writers that you would just sit them down and say, this, you know, this is what you have to do. Well, this one's the worst one is that you actually have to write. <laughs> and uh, like, you have to be very consistent with it. And, you know, understand that you know as Desiree said it's about iteration it's about like doing doing another pass taking a look at it again thinking things through while not trying to overthink it um that'd be my number one thing yeah I'm gonna add to that because I tell this to I know a lot of the students I mentor is you know iteration is important but sometimes they over iterate and they've been working on the same idea for a year and at a certain point you know, you just need to move on and it's better, especially when you're starting out, it's sometimes better to have a quantity of scripts um, because you actually learn, I think you, and for us, we found that we learned better that way by having, moving on to a different script and taking lessons we learned from the last script to improve the next one. Uh, when Erica and I first started writing together, we were like, we set a quota, of, we're going to write five, half hour comedies this year yeah. um and most of those scripts were completely unusable but one of those scripts was the one that we still use today that still gets us work but if we hadn't done those other four, four. <laughs> yeah and yeah. i think even before we had you know agency representation we had pretty much written about 10 scripts before we had gotten our agents mm -hmm. and most of them were unusable <laughs> Yes. So it's like, you're lucky, but it only takes one to then, you know, be a very useful sample and help you get work. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. Are there, anybody have one more? We have time for one more maybe, but yeah, I think we're good. Thank you, Erica and Desiree so Thank much. You. This was just really enjoyable, informative and uh, everybody go download nuclear power. Don't wait for the library to get it in. It is on order, but you don't, you don't want to wait that long. And uh, 
Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.